Welcome to the full video lecture for Lesson 11, Chi-Square Tests. The content covered in this lesson is covered in Chapter 7 of the Lock 5 textbook. Chi is this Greek letter. It looks similar to an italicized X. Chi-Square is a probability distribution similar to the Z, T, and F distributions that we've seen so far. We'll see an example shortly, but in terms of shape, the chi-square distribution is skewed to the right like the F distribution. The tests that we're going to be covering this week are used when we have data concerning one or two categorical variables. Before we begin, there are several topics that I want to review. These were all introduced in Lesson 2 when we learned how to summarize and display data concerning one and two categorical variables. Let's start by reviewing frequency tables. A frequency table displays data from one categorical variable. Here's an example that was constructed using Minitab Express. When I make frequency tables, I usually include the name of the category, the frequency count, and the percentages. These are the steps that you would follow in Minitab Express to construct a frequency table. I'm not going to review this here, but you can find an example in the review section of this week's online notes. A two-way contingency table displays data from two categorical variables. Here's an example that I made using Minitab Express and the class survey dataset from the textbook. The key at the top tells us that the rows represent biological sex. Looking at the row labels, the first row labeled F, is females, and the second row, labeled M, would be males. The columns represent the smoke variable. This is whether or not the individual smokes. The first column is students who said no, they do not smoke. The second column is students who said yes, they do smoke. As an example, the number of females who do not smoke is 153. These are the steps that you would follow in Minitab Express to construct a two-way table. Again, I'm not going to walk through this because you've already done it in Lesson 2 and there's an example in this week's online notes. The third point I want to review are probability distribution plots. StatKey will make these for the Z, T, F, and chi-square distributions. Minitab Express has even more options if you follow the steps here. These are some examples of probability distribution plots that we've seen in the course. Like the T and F distributions, the chi-square distribution is going to look different depending on the degrees of freedom. These are some examples of chi-square distributions. You can see that they are all skewed to the right. We will learn how to make these plots when we get to the first learning objective for this lesson. The fourth point that I want to review is conditional probability. A conditional probability is the probability of one event occurring given that a second event is known to have occurred. This is often communicated with this notation. The line in the middle is read as given. So I would read this as the probability of A given B. Let's look at an example using the two-way contingency table from earlier. Let's find the probability that someone smokes given that they are female. This is how I would write that using notation. Looking at the table, I'm only interested in the females. We can ignore the males for this question. Of the 169 females in this sample, 16 said that they did smoke. 16 over 169 gives us a conditional probability of 0 0.095. Let's do one more example. What is the probability that someone is male given that they smoke? This is how I would write that using the notation. Probability of male given smokes. Here, we're only interested in the smokers. We're not interested in any of the non-smokers. 
of the 43 smokers in this sample, 27 were male. 27 over 43 gives us a conditional probability of 0 0.628. The last point that I want to review is independence. Independent events are unrelated. The outcome of one event does not impact the probability of the second event occurring. In terms of conditional probabilities, that means that the probability of A equals the probability of A given B. In other words, knowing that B occurred does not change the likeliness of A occurring. Another way to look at this is that there is no relationship or no correlation between the events. If you're looking for more in-depth reviews, I recommend going back to Lesson 2 where most of these topics were originally introduced, or posting a question to your course discussion board in Canvas. Your instructor may be able to point you to some additional resources. This brings us to the new learning objectives for Lesson 11. Most of these learning objectives I think will be fairly quick to cover, except for our Objective 4, which is to conduct the chi-square test by hand and using Minitab Express. That may take longer because we're going to go through examples of each type of test, both using hand calculations and using Minitab Express. Let's get started with the first learning objective. Construct a chi-square probability distribution plot in StatKey or Minitab Express. These are the steps that you'll follow. I will walk through one example using StatKey and then Minitab Express. In StatKey, in the theoretical distributions area, we've already constructed normal distributions, T distributions, and F distributions. The only one remaining is the chi-square distribution, which is what we'll be using this week. When we click chi-square, as with the T and F distributions, StatKey is first going to ask us what our degrees of freedom are. We're learning about two different chi-square tests this week, and the formulas for degrees of freedom will be different for each. We'll learn those formulas later. For now, let's say that we have three degrees of freedom. This is a chi-square distribution with three degrees of freedom. It's skewed to the right. Like the F test that we did in the last lesson, chi-square tests will always be right-tailed. To find a p-value, we'll click right tail, and then at the bottom, we'll enter our observed test statistic. For this example, let's say that we had a test statistic of 6. With 3 degrees of freedom and a test statistic of chi-square equals 6, we would have a p-value of 0 0.112. I'll take you over to Minitab Express to run through a quick example there as well. I'm on a PC right now. So I'll go to Statistics, Distribution Plot, Display Probability. If you're on a Mac, it would be Statistics, Probability Distributions, Distribution Plot, Display Probability. The default is a normal distribution. We want to change this to a chi-square distribution. We'll do the same example that we just did in StatKey, with three degrees of freedom and a test statistic of six. Remember that our test statistics are what Minitab Express calls specified X values. Chi-square tests will always be right-tailed. If I enter in our test statistic of six, the p-value here is identical to the one that we found in StatKey, so Minitab Express will go out to more decimal places. Our second learning objective is to determine when a chi-square goodness of fit test and chi-square test of independence should be conducted. A chi-square goodness of fit test is used with one categorical variable with more than two categories. 
You can conduct a goodness of fit test when the variable has just two categories, but as you can see in the note here, a goodness of fit test with only two categories is equivalent to a single sample proportion z-test. In those cases, the z-test is preferred because it's slightly simpler. A chi-square test of independence has two or more categorical variables. I put the or more in brackets here because in this course, we'll only be doing two-way chi-square tests, which have only two categorical variables. But it is possible to conduct chi-square tests of independence with three or more categorical variables. Let's look at a few examples of selecting the appropriate test. There are three different colors of Reese's Pieces, orange, yellow, and brown. Are the proportions of these three colors unequal? In order to determine what type of test to conduct, we need to identify the variable or variables. The variable here is color. This is a categorical variable with three levels, orange, yellow, and brown. Because there is one categorical variable with more than two levels, we should conduct a chi-square goodness of fit test. Here's another example. We have a six-sided die and want to know if there is evidence that the die is unevenly weighted. In other words, we want to know if the proportion of rolls that are a one, two, three, four, five, and six are not all equal. The variable here is the result of the roll. So whether it's a one, two, three, four, five, or six. Because there is one categorical variable with six levels, we should conduct a chi-square goodness of fit test. And one more example. Is there a relationship between favorite ice cream and cupcake flavors? Here we have the survey that participants were given. We can see that there were two questions. What is your favorite ice cream flavor? And what is your favorite cupcake flavor? Those two questions are two variables. Both are categorical. To determine if there is evidence of a relationship between two categorical variables, we should conduct a chi-square test of independence. Our third learning objective is to compute and interpret expected counts. Both the goodness of fit test and the test of independence are going to involve expected counts. In both cases, expected counts are computed given that the null hypothesis is true. This is the number of cases that we would expect to see in each cell if the null hypothesis were true. The formulas are different for the goodness of fit test and the test of independence. Let's start with some examples from the goodness of fit test. The formula that we're going to use is n times p sub i, where n is the total sample size and p sub i is the hypothesized proportion for the ith group. The value of p sub i we'll get from the null hypothesis. Here's an example. There are three different colors of Reese's pieces, orange, yellow, and brown. Are the proportions of these three colors unequal? A random sample of n equals 30 Reese's Pieces was obtained. Here are the counts of each color in our sample. There were 12 orange, 11 yellow, and 7 brown for a total of 30. I like to start by writing the hypotheses. The procedure for writing the hypotheses here is very similar from what we've done in the past. The null hypothesis is going to contain all of the equalities, and the alternative is going to include some difference or differences. If the proportions of orange, yellow, and brown were all equal, they would all equal one over three. So our null hypothesis is that P sub O equals P sub Y equals P sub B equals one over three. You could also write this as P sub O equals one third, P sub Y equals one third, and P sub B equals one third. These are equivalent statements. Here, we want to know if there's evidence that the proportions for orange, yellow, and brown are not all equal. This will be the alternative hypothesis. 
I find that the alternative hypothesis is usually most easily written out as a phrase like this, as opposed to trying to use equations. Because what we're really saying here is that the proportion of orange does not equal one third and or the proportion of yellow does not equal one third and or the proportion of brown does not equal one third. And there's not an easy way to clearly communicate that as an equation without learning even more notation. All we really need to compute the expected values though is the null hypothesis because we just need those values of p sub i. The value of n is always going to be the same for all of the cells. This is the total sample size. Here, n equals 30. In this particular example, all of our p sub i values are the same. They're all 1 over 3. So all of our expected counts are going to be the same in this example because we have equal hypothesized proportions. They're all going to be 30 times 1 over 3, which equals 10. To check our answer, the sum of all of the expected counts should equal the total sample size. 10 plus 10 plus 10 equals 30. Let's do a different type of example, one where the hypothesized proportions are not all equal. A friend claims that 50% of Americans prefer the beach, 30% prefer the mountains, and 20% prefer to stay at home. You collect data from a sample of 100 to determine if there is evidence that her estimates are wrong. Here, I've covered up the observed counts for the three groups because we don't actually need them. When we're computing expected counts, the total sample size is all that we need. The observed counts aren't needed until later when we compute the chi-square test statistic. Our null hypothesis here is going to contain the values from the question. That is, is the proportion who prefer the beach equal to 0 0.5, the proportion who prefer the mountains 0 0.3, and the proportion who prefer to stay at home 0 0.2. The alternative, when the proportions are different for each group, I usually write like this. At least one p sub i is not as specified in the null. All we really need to compute the expected values, though, is the null hypothesis, because we need n and the values of p. The value of n is the total sample size of 100. The value of p is different for each group, so here we'll have different expected values for each cell. Let's start with the beach group. 100 times 0 0.5 gives us an expected count of 50. In other words, if the null hypothesis were true, so if the friend were correct, we would expect 50 out of 100 people in a sample to prefer the beach. For the mountain group, 100 times 0 0.3 equals 30. In other words, if the friend were correct, we would expect 30 out of 100 to prefer the mountains. And for the stay-at-home group, 100 times 0 0.2 gives us an expected count of 20. If the friend were correct, we would expect 20 out of 100 to prefer staying at home. To check our answer, these expected counts should add up to 100. 50 plus 30 plus 20 does equal 100. Next, I'll go through examples for chi-square tests of independence. The formula looks different here, but we're still trying to get at the same concept. That is, if the null hypothesis is true, what values would we expect to see in each cell? Here's the first example for a test of independence. Is there a relationship between biological sex and favorite hot beverage? Here are the data from our sample. There were 60 females and 40 males. It looks like they were given three options of hot beverages coffee, hot chocolate, and tea. We can start by thinking about the hypotheses, because the expected counts are going to be computed given that the null hypothesis is true. For a chi-square test of independence, the hypotheses are always going to be very similar. 
the null will always be that there is not a relationship in the population. The formula that we're given here for the expected cell counts will compute the expected values given that there is not a relationship between the two variables in the population. Let's start in the first cell for females and coffee. The expected count will be the row total times the column total divided by the grand total. 56 times 60 divided by 100 equals 33.6. To interpret this, I would say that if there is not a relationship between biological sex and preferred hot beverage, in a sample of 100, we would expect 33.6 people to fall into this cell. Next, let's look at the cell for males and coffee. The row total again is 56. The column total now is 40. And the grand total for this example will always be 100. 56 times 40 divided by 100 gives us an expected count for this cell of 22.4. If there is not a relationship between biological sex and preferred hot beverage in the population, we would expect a sample of 100 to have about 22.4 males who prefer coffee. We'll continue with this pattern for the remaining four cells. For females and hot chocolate, 17 times 60 divided by 100 is 10.2. For males and hot chocolate, 17 times 40 divided by 100 is 6.8. Females in T, 27 times 60 divided by 100 is 16.2. And males in T, 27 times 40 divided by 100 is 10.8. Our fourth learning objective is to conduct chi-square tests by hand and using Minitab Express. We'll be using the five-step hypothesis testing procedure again this week. Before we walk through some examples, I'll show you the five steps, starting with the goodness of fit test. Step one is to check assumptions and write hypotheses. The assumption for using the chi-square distribution is that all expected counts must be at least five. If this assumption is not met, then you cannot use the chi-square distribution. You could use randomization methods in those cases, which StatKey will do for you, but we will not be covering in this course. Just know that in order to use the chi-square distribution, you need all expected counts to be at least 5. The null hypothesis is going to be written in terms of the hypothesized population proportion for each group. These values will be determined by your research question. The alternative hypothesis is essentially every possibility that is not the null. I usually write this as at least one p sub i is not as specified in the null. Step two is to compute the test statistic. This is the formula for the chi-square test statistic. It is the sum of all of the observed values minus the expected values squared divided by the expected value. We'll walk through a few examples of this because I know it could be confusing to find the correct order of operations at first, but after you do it a few times, I think you'll get the hang of it. Step three is to determine the p-value. Construct a chi-square distribution with k minus one degrees of freedom, where k is the number of groups. The p-value will be in the right tail. Chi-square tests will always be right tail tests. The p-value is the area under your chi-square distribution that is greater than the test statistic that you computed in step two. Step four, make a decision. If the p-value is greater than the alpha level, which is usually 0.05, then you fail to reject the null hypothesis. In that case, there is not evidence that the population proportions are different from what is specified in the null. If the p-value is less than or equal to the alpha level, then you reject the null hypothesis. This means that there is evidence that at least one of the population proportions is different from what is specified in the null. 
And step five, state your conclusion. This is where you go back to your original research question and write a sentence or two to summarize your results. Next, we'll look at the five-step procedure for the chi-square test of independence. Step one, check assumptions and write hypotheses. Again, the assumption is that all expected counts must be at least five. If this assumption is not met, then you cannot use the chi-square distribution. You would need to use randomization methods, which are available in StatKey, but not covered in this course. The null hypothesis is that there is not a relationship between X and Y in the population. Here, you should replace the X and Y with the actual names of the variables that you're studying. The alternative hypothesis is that there is a relationship between X and Y in the population. Again, replace the X and Y with the names of the variables that you're working with. Step two is to compute the test statistic. This is the same formula that we saw with the goodness of fit test. We know that how we compute the expected values is different for the two tests, but then how we compute the test statistic is actually the same. Step three is to determine the p-value. Construct a chi-square distribution with rows minus one times columns minus one degrees of freedom. The p-value will be in the right tail. Chi-square tests will always be right-tail tests. The p-value is the area under your chi-square distribution that is greater than the test statistic that you computed in step two. Step four, make a decision. If the p-value is greater than the alpha level, which is typically 0.05, then you fail to reject the null hypothesis. This means that the results are not statistically significant and there is not evidence of a relationship in the population. If the p-value is less than or equal to the alpha level, then you reject the null hypothesis. The results are statistically significant, and there is evidence of a relationship between the two variables in the population. And step five, state your conclusion. Go back to the original research question and write one or two sentences to summarize your results. Either there is evidence of a relationship in the population, or there is not. If we compare the goodness of fit test to the test of independence, we can see that there are a lot of similarities. The only differences are how the hypotheses are worded and how the degrees of freedom are computed. They have the same assumptions and steps two, four, and five are identical. Now, I want to walk through a couple examples of each type of test by hand. Then I'll take you to Minitab Express and we'll do some examples there as well. This is an example that we saw earlier. There are three different colors of Reese's pieces, orange, yellow, and brown. Are the proportions of these three colors unequal in the population? A random sample of n equals 30 Reese's pieces was obtained. In that random sample of 30, there were 12 orange, 11 yellow, and seven brown Reese's pieces. Let's use the five-step hypothesis testing procedure to address this question. We have one categorical variable, so we're going to be conducting a chi-square goodness of fit test. Step one, check assumptions and write hypotheses. The assumption is that all expected counts must be at least five. When we computed the expected counts earlier, we first wrote our hypotheses. The null is that the proportions are all equal. So P sub O equals P sub Y equals P sub B equals one third. The alternative is that at least one P sub I is not as specified in the null. With this, we computed the expected counts to all be N times P, which was 30 times one third equals 10. In other words, if the population proportions were all equal, in a sample of 30, we would expect 10 of each color. All of the expected counts are at least five, so we can use the chi-square distribution here. Step two, compute the test statistic. Here's our formula. In the table above, we have each of the observed and expected values. I like to compute the contribution for each cell and then add them all together. For the orange group, 
the observed value was 12 and the expected value was 10. In the numerator, we have observed minus expected squared, and in the denominator, the expected value. So for the orange group, 12 minus 10 is 2, squared is 4, divided by 10 is 0 0.4. For the yellow group, 11 is the observed value and 10 is the expected value. So the chi-square contribution for the yellow cell is 11 minus 10, which is 1, squared is 1, divided by 10 is 0 0.1. And the brown group, the observed value is 7, expected value is 10. 7 minus 10 is negative 3, squared is positive 9, divided by 10 is 0 0.9. To get the chi-square test statistic, we add up these three values. This is the summation in the formula. 0 0.4 plus 0 0.1 plus 0 0.9 gives us a chi-square test statistic of 1.4. Step three is to determine the p-value. To do this, we'll construct a chi-square distribution, either in StatKey or Minitab Express, with k minus one degrees of freedom, where k is the number of groups. Here we have three groups, giving us two degrees of freedom. I'll take you to StatKey to find this p-value. In the theoretical distributions row, we're constructing a chi-square distribution. We said that we had two degrees of freedom, Chi-square tests are always right-tailed tests. The cutoff at the bottom we changed to our chi-square test statistic, which was 1.4. Our p-value is 0 0.497. Step four, make a decision. The p-value was greater than the standard alpha level of 0 0.05, so we fail to reject the null hypothesis. And step five, state your conclusion. There is not evidence that the population proportions are not all one third. Let's do one more goodness of fit test by hand. We saw this example earlier as well. A friend claims that 50% of Americans prefer the beach, 30% prefer the mountains, and 20% prefer to stay at home. You collect data from a sample of 100 to determine if there is evidence that her estimates are wrong. In the table here, we have our observed values from our sample of n equals 100. We have one categorical variable, so we're going to be conducting a chi-square goodness of fit test. Step one is to check assumptions and write hypotheses. The assumption is that all expected counts must be at least five. Here's our formula for the expected counts. Each expected count is equal to n times p, where n is the total sample size and p is the hypothesized population proportion for that group. The p's are the number in the null hypothesis. So let's go ahead and write our hypotheses so we can compute our expected counts. We are given percentages in the research question that we can convert to proportions. The null hypothesis is that P for the beach is 0 0.50, P for mountains is 0 0.30, and P for staying at home is 0 0.20. The alternative hypothesis I usually write as at least one P sub I is not as specified in the null. We can use the proportions in the null to compute all of our expected counts. For the beach group, N is 100, and P from the null hypothesis is 0 0.50 for an expected count of 50. For the mountains group, 100 times the hypothesized proportion of 0 0.30 gives us an expected count of 30. And for the home group, 100 times the hypothesized proportion of 0 0.20 gives us an expected count of 20. In other words, if the friend's claims were correct, 
in a random sample of 100, we would expect 50 people to say the beach, 30 to say the mountains, and 20 to say staying at home. All of these expected counts are at least five, so we can use the chi-square distribution here. Step two, compute the test statistic. Here's our formula. I'll start with the beach group. The observed count was 65, and the expected count was 50. 65 minus 50 squared divided by 50 equals 4.50. For the mountains group, the observed count was 20, and the expected count was 30. 20 minus 30 squared divided by 30 equals 3.33. And for the home group, the observed count was 15 and the expected count was 20. 15 minus 20 squared divided by 20 equals 1.25. The chi-square test statistic is the sum of these three values, 4.50 plus 3.33 plus 1.25 gives us a chi-square test statistic of 9.08. Step three is to determine the p-value. To do this, you'll use StatKey or Minitab Express to construct a chi-square distribution with degrees of freedom equal to the number of groups minus one. We have three groups, minus one gives us two degrees of freedom. I'll take you to StatKey to find the p-value. It will be the area under a chi-square distribution with two degrees of freedom greater than a chi-square value of 9.08. We'll construct a chi-square distribution with two degrees of freedom. Chi-square tests are always right-tail test, and we change the value at the bottom to our observed test statistic, which was 9.08. Our p-value is 0 0.011. Step four, make a decision. Our p-value was less than or equal to the standard 0 0.05 alpha level, so we reject the null hypothesis. And step five, state your conclusion. We rejected the null, so there is evidence that the friend's estimates are not all correct. At least one of the proportions is not as she specified. Now, I want to do an example of a chi-square test of independence by hand. Then, I'll take you to Minitab Express to show you how each of these could be conducted there. Here is another example that we saw earlier. Is there a relationship between biological sex and favorite hot beverage? In this table, we have our observed counts. We have two categorical variables, so we'll be conducting a chi-square test of independence. Step one is to check assumptions and write hypotheses. The assumption is that all expected counts must be at least five. Here's our formula for the expected counts for the two-way test of independence. I'll go through these relatively quickly because we already covered this in the last learning objective. For the female's coffee cell, the row total times the column total divided by the grand total is 56 times 60 divided by 100 equals 33.6. For the male's coffee cell, row total times column total divided by grand total equals 22.4. And the rest of the cells, I'll just go through quickly. Again, we computed all of these back in the third learning objective. So if you need a review, you can go back to that section. Sometimes you'll see the expected values written in parentheses to save space, like this. To finish step one, we can write our hypotheses. The null is that the two variables, biological sex and favorite hot beverage, are not related in the population. The alternative hypothesis is that biological sex and favorite hot beverage are related in the population. Step two, compute the test statistic. 
We'll be using the same formula for the chi-square test statistic. Again, I'll go through each cell, take the observed minus the expected squared, divided by the expected. We'll start with the female's coffee cell. The observed count was 34 and the expected count was 33.6. 34 minus 33.6 squared divided by 33.6 equals 0 0.005. For the male's coffee cell, the observed count was 22 and the expected count was 22.4. 22, 22 minus 22.4 squared divided by 22.4 equals 0 0.007. These first two chi-square contributions are small because the observed and expected counts were very similar. For the female's hot chocolate cell, 9 minus 10.2 squared divided by 10.2 equals 0 0.141. And we'll continue with the same pattern for the last three cells. 8 minus 6.8 .8 squared divided by 6.8 equals 0 0.212. 17 minus 16.2 squared divided by 16.2 equals 0 0.040. And 10 minus 10.8 squared divided by 10.8 equals 0 0.059. The chi-square test statistic is the sum of these six values, 0 0.005, plus 0 0.007, plus 0 0.141, plus 0 0.212, plus 0 0.040, plus 0 0.059, gives us a chi-square test statistic of 0 0.464. Step three is to determine the p-value. To do this, we're going to construct a chi-square distribution. The degrees of freedom will be the number of rows minus one times the number of columns minus one. This is three minus one times two minus one, which gives us two degrees of freedom. I'll take you to stat key now to make a chi-square distribution with two degrees of freedom. The p-value will be the area to the right of the test statistic of 0.464. In the theoretical distributions row, we're constructing a chi-square distribution. We said that we have two degrees of freedom. Chi-square tests are always right-tailed tests. And we set the cutoff at the bottom to our observed test statistic, which was 0 0.464. Our p-value is 0 0.793. Step four, make a decision. Our p-value is greater than the standard 0.05 alpha level, so we fail to reject the null. And step five, state your conclusion. There is not evidence that biological sex and preferred hot beverage are related in the population. Those are all of the examples that I'm going to do by hand for you. On the quiz or exam, you may be asked to do part of this procedure by hand to show that you understand each piece of the process. On the lab assignment and in real life, unless you're specifically asked to do this by hand, you should use Minitab Express. The first set of examples that I'm going to do in Minitab Express use the water taste data set from the LOC5 textbook. You can access all of the textbook's data sets at this website. Water taste will be towards the bottom. The MTW file is the Minitab Express file. If you have Minitab Express installed on your machine, you should be able to open this directly from the download. In this data set, we have 10 variables. Gender is categorical with two groups, female and male. Age is quantitative. Class is categorical 
Usually drink is categorical with three groups, filtered, tap, or bottled water, favorite bottled water brand, and the last five are also categorical variables considering the order of each case's preference. For the first example, I want to know if there are any differences between the proportions of people who prefer filtered, tap, and bottled water in the population. My research question is concerning the usually drink variable. With just one categorical variable with three groups, I'm going to conduct a chi-square goodness of fit test. I'm on a PC, so I'll go to statistics, chi-square goodness of fit. If you're on a Mac, you'll go to statistics, tables, chi-square goodness of fit. Here, I have raw data. In other words, I have a Minitab Express file where each row is one case. Minitab Express calls this categorical data in a column. Later, I'll also show you an example using summarized data. My research question was concerning the usually drink variable. I wanted to know if any of the proportions are different. So the null hypothesis is that the proportions are all equal. Equal proportions is the default in Minitab Express. When we click OK, here's our output. In the first table, we have our observed counts for each category, the test proportion, which is the proportion in the null hypothesis. Here, there were three groups, and the null was that they were all equal, so one-third is 0 0.333333. The expected counts are all 33.3333, which is at least five, so we can use the chi-square distribution here. The last column here is the contribution to the chi-square, which is the observed minus expected squared divided by expected. The second table gives us the sample size n. The n with an asterisk is the number of missing values. So if someone didn't answer this question, they would be counted here. The degrees of freedom, which was the number of groups minus one the chi-square test statistic, and the p-value. Because the p-value is greater than the standard 0.05 alpha level, we should fail to reject the null hypothesis. There is not evidence that the proportion of people in the population who prefer bottled, filtered, and tap water are different. Next, I want to use the same data set to conduct a chi-square test of independence. I'll use the gender and usually drink variables. So there are two categorical variables here, gender with two levels, and usually drink with three levels. I'm on a PC, so I'll go to statistics, cross tabulation, and chi-square. If you're on a Mac, you'll go to statistics, tables, cross tabulation, and chi-square. I'm going to put gender in the rows, and usually drink in the columns. The order that you enter the variables in here will not impact the test statistic or p-value, so if you flip them, the final results will be exactly the same. Under the Display tab, if you leave everything unchecked, all you'll get is a contingency table. This is what we did back in Lesson 2. You need to select chi-square test for association in order to get the test statistic and p-value. You should also check expected cell counts because you need to check that they're all at least five before using the chi-square test statistic and p-value. First, we have our contingency table. In the key, we can see that each cell includes the count, that's the observed count, and the expected count. All of our expected counts are at least five, so we can use the chi-square distribution. In the second table, we are going to use the Pearson row. We are not going to use the likelihood ratio, which is computed a little differently. We'll always ignore that row. Here, 
the chi-square test statistic that we're using is 8.48 with two degrees of freedom. The p-value is 0 0.0144. The p-value is less than the standard 0 0.05 alpha level, so we will reject the null hypothesis. There is evidence of a relationship in the population between gender and type of water that one usually drinks. Next, I want to show you how to use summarized data in Minitab Express. To do this, I'm going to use the examples that we did by hand. I'll take you back to the PowerPoint slides now to get the data that we're going to be using. Here's the Reese's Pieces example that we've been working with. There is one categorical variable with three categories, so we're conducting a goodness of fit test. In the table, we have summarized data. In our null hypothesis, we have that the population proportions are all equal. This is all of the information that we need to run this in Minitab Express. I'm going to open a new Minitab Express worksheet where we'll enter in these values. Column one will be the color. We have orange, yellow, and brown. The second column will be the count. We had 12 orange, 11 yellow, and 7 brown in our sample. Do not enter the totals because Minitab Express would treat that as if it was a fourth category. I'm on a PC, so I'll go to Statistics, Chi-Square, Goodness of Fit. If you were on a Mac, you would go to Statistics, Tables, Chi-Square, Goodness of Fit. Now we have summarized data. The observed counts were in our second column, and the category names, which are actually optional, but I always include, were in the first column. The null hypothesis by default is that the population proportions are all equal, which was the case here. We click OK. And now in the first table, if you compare this to what we did by hand earlier, the expected counts are all 10, and the contributions to the chi-square were 0 0.40, 0 0.10, and 0 0.90. In the second table, two degrees of freedom, chi-square test statistic of 1.40, and p-value of 0 0.4966. The p-value is greater than the standard 0 0.05 alpha level, so we fail to reject the null, there is not evidence that in the population, the proportions are not all equal to 0 0.333333. Here's the other goodness of fit test that we did by hand earlier. We have summarized data, but this one will be a little different because now we have specified population proportions that are not all equal. I'm going to go back to Minitab Express to enter these data, just like I did for the Reese's Pieces example, and I'll show you how to set this up so that the population proportions that we're testing have different probabilities. I'll delete the old data. Our first column now we'll call location, beach, mountains, or home. The second column again will be the counts, 65, 20, and 15. Again, do not enter the totals because Minitab Express would treat that as if it's a fourth category. I'll run this chi-square goodness of fit test just like we did the last one. Again, we have summarized data in a table, counts, and category names, but now we're not testing equal proportions. Now we're testing specified proportions. These are the values from the null hypothesis. Be very careful here because Minitab Express will present you with the categories in alphabetical order. While we enter the data for beach, mountain, home in that order, Minitab Express is presenting us with beach, home, mountains in alphabetical order. So be aware of that. Our null hypothesis was that the proportion for the beach was 0.50. Note that there is a glitch in Minitab Express here, and you may not be able to see the values as you're entering them.
They are aware of this issue and hopefully it will be fixed in the near future. For home, we said that P was 0 0.20 and for the mountains, 0 0.30. We'll click OK. Again, the values in the first table should match what we did earlier. In the second table, our chi-square test statistic with two degrees of freedom is 9.08 with a p-value of 0 0.0107. The p-value is less than the standard 0.05 alpha level, so we reject the null hypothesis. There is evidence that the friend's estimates are not all correct. At least one of the proportions is not as she specified. The last example that I want to do in Minitab Express is the chi-square test of independence that we had done by hand. Is there a relationship between biological sex and favorite hot beverage? I'll go back to Minitab Express to enter the observed counts again. In the first column, I'm going to put the names of the drinks. We had coffee, hot chocolate, and tea. Then we had females and males. For the females, the observed counts were 34, 9, and 17. For males, 22, 8, and 10. I'm on a PC, so I'll go to Statistics, Cross Tabulation, and Chi-Square. If you're on a Mac, you'll go to Statistics, Tables, Cross Tabulation, and Chi-Square. We have summarized data in a two-way table. The columns containing the table are the females and males. So these are the columns that have the numbers. The row labels, which are optional, was my first column where I put the names of the drinks. Under display, we need to select chi-square test for association in order to get the test statistic and the p-value. We also need the expected cell counts so we can test the assumption that all expected counts are at least five. In the first table, we have the observed and expected counts in our two-way contingency table. All of the expected counts are at least five, so we can use the chi-square distribution here. In the second table, we're using the Pearson chi-square test statistic which was 0 0.46 with two degrees of freedom and a p-value of 0 0.7931. The p-value is greater than the standard 0 0.05 alpha level, so we fail to reject the null hypothesis. There is not evidence that biological sex and preferred hot beverage are related in the population. This brings us to our fifth and final learning objective for this lesson, calculate and interpret relative risk. Relative risk can be used to compare the proportions of two groups. It's sometimes used as a measure of practical significance with a chi-square test of independence. In lesson two, we learned that risk is equal to the number with the outcome divided by the total number. This can also be referred to as a proportion or probability. Relative risk is the ratio of risks for two different groups. In other words, the risk for group one divided by the risk for group two. I'll go through a couple of examples. Compare the proportion of females who prefer coffee to the proportion of males who prefer coffee. The relative risk will be equal to the risk for females divided by the risk for males. For females, 34 out of 60 preferred coffee. For males, 22 out of 40 preferred coffee. In decimal form, 0 0.567 to 0 0.55 gives us a relative risk of 1.030. To interpret this, I would say that females are 1.030 times more likely than males to prefer coffee. Because the risk ratio is right around 1, that tells us that the proportions for males and females are very similar to one another.
Let's look at one more example. During the fall 2017 semester, 90% of Penn Tech students were Pennsylvania residents. That same semester, 38% of World Campus students were Pennsylvania residents. Compute the relative risk comparing Penn Tech and World Campus in terms of the proportion of students who were Pennsylvania residents. This will be equal to the risk for Penn Tech over the risk for World Campus. At Penn Tech, 90% or 0 0.90 were Pennsylvania residents. World Campus was 38% or 0 0.38. For a risk ratio of 2.368. To interpret this, I would say that Penn Tech students were 2.368 times more likely than World Campus students to be Pennsylvania residents. In other words, Penn Tech students are more than twice as likely than World Campus students to be Pennsylvania residents. This concludes the full video lecture for Lesson 11. If you have any questions, please post them to the Lesson 11 discussion board in Canvas.